Dracula. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. I mean. The fight is that the blood of a thousand men and women was filled in these laws. Limbs twisted and broken. Eyes gouged from bloody sockets. Fresh burned black. in this world that go way beyond human understanding. Things that cannot be explained. Things that most people don't want to know about. But we're going to talk about them anyway. World of the Unexplained with Jay Scott and Trent Blackie. Heard Mondays live from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern on the Omnisound Radio 1 Network. Right here, baby. www.omnisoundradio1.net Welcome. <laughs> oh, a little was, slow on the great. draw. I love that. Welcome. Do good, do good, do good. Okay, what's up, guys? <laughs> this is Jay Scott. This is Trey Lackey. Welcome to World of the Unexplained. Yeah, tonight we've got a uh, special treat for you guys. Um, I know a lot of you guys have emailed us about these guests, and um, so welcome. Um, unfortunately, our 800 number uh, is not going to be working tonight for you to call in because yeah. we're using uh, we're bars. using that line. So um, anyway, we've got Dr. Sally Ryan Feather. She's the daughter of J.D. Ryan. And we also have Michael Schmicker. They're uh, co-authors of a book called The Gift, ESP, The Extraordinary Experiences of Ordinary People. So... Um, I don't know. Without further ado, I guess we'll we'll get get the show yep. on the road. How does that sound, Trent? I think that's a good idea. Let's fade this out. All right. Okay, uh, Michael, are you there with us? Yeah, I am, Jay. Sally, are you with us? I certainly am. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Oh uh, wow. Where to start? Where to start? Where yes. to start? Um, well, first let me let me say uh, thank you for coming on the show tonight. We uh, usually get around ten, well, close to ten thousand listeners, around nine thousand internet listeners, and there's about a hundred stations that picks up the feed all over the country and all over the world. So there's a um, quite a broad so we, base. Um, our listeners tonight can email us at worldoftheunexplained at gmail dot com, or they can jump on the chat room from the website worldoftheunexplained dot com. Just click chat, yep. make up a name, jump on in here, and ask us any questions you would like us to relate to our guest tonight. Mm-hmm. Any kind of name, either. Whatever. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, wow. Okay. Um, um, uh, let's start out with. Let's start out. How with about just a question. background? Okay. That's Go a ahead. good idea. I mean, uh, how did you uh, how did you uh, to um, get, get together. together to compile this book, and uh, you know what prompted you to do it? Well, Mike, this was your idea, so you take it. <laughs> so here, let me start. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, uh, Jay and Trent, what happened was that uh, Sally, uh, Doctor Sally Ryan Feather, is the daughter of uh, one of the most famous people that have ever done ESP research in the United States. Oh yeah. His name was uh, Doctor uh, J. B. Ryan. And he did his research in the 1930s and 40s and 50s at Duke University and pioneered the scientific study of ESP at Duke University. And what happened was I had written an earlier book called Best Evidence, which was, again, about the paranormal. And uh, I came across uh, what I found was the largest database of ESP experiences in the world and it's, uh, it was uh, started uh, by uh, Sally's mom and her father, and they have over 14,000 cases of uh, reports of ESP, spontaneous ESP experiences. And on that basis, uh, after having finished my first book, I called her up and said, boy, this is an amazing uh, uh, collection of ESP. Uh, would you be interested in doing a book together? And uh, as it worked out, she was free and I was free, and we went ahead and uh, did the book, which, as you mentioned, is called The Gift and published by St. Martin's Press. You can find it on Amazon or Barnes and & Noble. And no, you found it on your stores. website, too, correct? Yeah, my website is uh, 
booksbymichael.com. And Sally, you want to give yours? Yes, ours is uh, www.rhine.org. Now, you work at the Rhine Research Center still in, in Durham, is that correct, That's Sally? correct. And uh, that's that's really um, that's really um, what what is it spontaneous ESP experiences? Yeah, that's right. What, what do you want? What do you well, want? This is going to prompt you a question about spontaneous oh, ESP. Well, we'll experience. Well, let me get some background <laughs> here. But yeah, for those of you that wow. don't know, Sally is the daughter of JB Ryan, and that's um, that's big stuff in the world of the paranormal. Yep, yeah, certainly is. And um, what, did your father? Did your father when you were a child? Did your father? kind of uh, lead you in this direction with his studies? Did he encourage your study of the paranormal? Well, or? not really. We were we thought we were a normal family. <laughs> Only later did I find out that not everybody's parents did study odd things. Um, so we were just raised like anybody else. But, uh, but that meant uh, I participated in some of the very early ESP card tests. My mother did the first study of children ever done and published way back in the 1930s. In those days... A woman who had to stay at home and take care of her kids could still do research around the kitchen table. Today, you would hardly see that happen. But um, so, yeah, I grew up kind of immersed in it. As a matter of fact. Well, that's, that's great. Hmm. Um, what were you saying about spontaneous ESP yeah, experience? Yeah, I, uh, I was just uh, curious. What it, what exactly did you mean by that? Spontaneous ESP experiences, uh, Michael. Yeah. Well, uh, Jay, what happens is that uh, these cases that we have in the book. Uh, the people didn't didn't try and produce the ESP. They didn't uh, test it under uh, scientific conditions. Uh, these ESP experiences, whether it was seeing the future or uh, reading somebody's mind, that happened to them without any warning. Uh, I think in almost all cases, uh, they weren't expecting it. Came out of the blue, so it's that's why we call it spontaneous ESP rather than ESP that you try and test in a laboratory. Oh, okay. No, fair enough. Do you do you still perform these tests, uh, Dr. Feather, at the Rhine Research Center? Oh yes, uh, the nature of them has changed quite a bit from way back in the 30s. Uh, it's quite different today, but we still do laboratory research. But we also pay sig- more attention to these reports that people send in. Not not any one of them in particular, because you never there's, there's so much human error and memory, and we don't count on any one case as being proof. But by the time you take hundreds of them and look at them together, you see patterns. And you find out that some people are, you know, are really show some differences from other people, and and that's kind of what we're looking for when we look at when we do case studies. Oh, okay. Well, Trent and I were at the Ryan Research Center years uh, ago. Approximately, I think it was '96 or '97. Dr. Richard Broughton was uh, the the head of that. Oh, Richard Broughton, yeah. Yeah, yes, and we. Dr. Uh, Broughton was then, yes, indeed. We had a. Uh, we had basically the, it was they our tested first, us. Yeah, it was our first little. <laughs> when we get to that, uh, it was our first little sort of foray into uh, the paranormal research, and it was a project for for um, psychology the, class, psychology college. class in college, and uh, it was it was a really fascinating place. Uh, it was uh, you had a uh, part of it, a little bit of a museum there going on with the research, and also the some of the testing that I remember. Um, there are computers and. Uh, very kind of high tech stuff, if I remember. Um, has that? Uh, have you? Now this was about six years hang ago. We, we don't have a. Can, can you guys hang on just a second? We don't have a stream for some reason. Something's not working. It's not. This is not getting out. No problem. Apparently. Now, uh, I guess we can just move on from where we, were, where that you'd made that discovery, Scott, right? Oh. Uh, about discovery. The, well, about the stream. Oh yeah. Well, we're, we're not going to talk about that. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so, <laughs> yeah, so anyway, okay, guys, again, if you want to talk to, if you want to talk to us, the 800 line's being used tonight, and so you can call us, well, you can't call us, but you can email us at worldintheunexplained at gmail.com, G for Google, or you can go to our chat room on the website, worldintheunexplained.com, jump right in there, and you can fire us your questions, and we will get them to our guests tonight. Okay. All right, now, um, where were we? Um, yeah, we were just saying that we had been to the Ryan Research Center years ago in college, and we had done um, some. Te- they had actually tested us for some, um, you know, for clairvoyance. I think was one of the tests. Uh, one of them was, uh, I want to say, telekinetics, or uh, yeah, well, we, maybe, we, we maybe. sat in this recliner. I think you sat in a recliner with these covers over your eyes. Mm-hmm. Probably did the, the telepathy test between two rooms. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I was well, trying uh, to look at a picture, and he was supposed that to. That was it. Yes. Yeah. Do y'all still do that there? Yes, we still do. It has been one of the most popular methods ever in the modern. T- it sort of tries to duplicate what it would be like in being in a dream state. Oh, okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, and there was another test involving computers where we clicked on a mouse, and there was a, 
I'm lying, and I guess we're supposed to mentally try to move this line up and down on the screen. Oh, yeah. yes, that might have been the business intuition, possibly, some, uh, trying to stimulate a stock market or something of that sort, trying to influence yeah. a random number generator process yeah. in the machine. Absolutely. You know, you know, Josh, I remember we took both those tests. Anyway. Josh Warren, a friend of ours, actually has a uh, project now. He calls it the Genesis Project. There's this thing of water he's got sitting in the ground somewhere, and uh, he... Um, He's basically trying to get everyone to think about it at one time to try to make something grow in it. So that should be, I don't know, interesting. I'm, I'm not sure. So is this this is your uh, first book together, Michael? Yeah, it is. Uh, first one with uh, Sally and I did together, yeah. Okay. But Michael had already done that first book on best evidence, which was the reason why I took him seriously <laughs> when he wrote to me because I liked his book. It, this was an uh, investigative journalist who really knows his background, knows his history, and is, I was very impressed. So it was an honor for me to be able to work with him. Uh, you awesome. know, Jay, the interesting thing about uh, Ryan Research Center, I think you all are in uh, broadcasting or, or doing the Internet out of North Carolina, yeah? Yes, mm -hmm. that's correct. That's correct. The, uh, the, the center is, uh, is in that state, and uh, I think if people are uh, interested in the paranormal, the people that listen to your show probably are, uh, Sally uh, and uh, the Ryan Center run a whole series of outstandingly interesting uh, programs uh, uh, every week. They've got something going on, so if people are in that area, they should ought, they ought to check the Ryan uh, www.ryan.org and find out what's going on. Uh, just like you all went down there and did a little test and things like that. There's all sorts of interesting uh, lectures and demonstrations and talks and things like that going on. Uh, do you still offer a summer program down there? Summer? We are going to uh, we're going to renew our summer program this coming summer. We haven't even got it up on the web yet, but we've made a decision to to have a two week a two or three week program starting on August the 12th, and we'll have a notice up on our website within the week probably. Excellent. Now you guys aren't connected with Duke University anymore, are you? No, we have no official connection with Duke University. We are going to be having a conference that is going to be located on the Duke campus however, in May, and that's going to be a big, huge conference entitled After Death, What Do We Know? Okay. And that's going to bring together the leading experts in the country who have done scholarly or scientific work that bears on the afterlife question. Oh, that's a very uh, cool thing. Scott's really into the, uh, the near-death and after-death experiences. We Absolutely. Have we'll have an expert on, after, on near death, uh, Bruce Grayson. We'll have... A, uh, experts on um, apparitions. We will have a whole variety of of the country's leading experts. Very cool. Great. And so, how did you go? How did you guys go about writing this? Did Did Michael do all the writing and you did the research, or a little of both? You wrote some. He wrote some. Um, how How was the collaboration on this project? I think it's everybody. Everybody. We, everybody worked on everything. <laughs> okay. I mean, but Sally <laughs> Sally is clearly the expert here. You know, she has the. Uh, uh, I don't know if your listeners know, but. Uh, uh, Sally actually is a has a doctorate in clinical psychology and has been in uh, in clinical psychology and um, for over 30 years, 35 years. So she's a, a professional, a longtime professional in the field of psychology, as well as parapsychology. So, well, the wonderful thing for me is, and and programs like your own, um, Jay, bring bring in these kinds of reports. But over the years, first my mother and now myself, people mail these stories. They want somebody to listen. They want somebody to know about what's happened to them. So they send them to us, and we keep, with their permission, we keep their stories and occasionally use them for a book or a program like your own right now and repeat back the kinds of cases. And because of the, the public, the general public, sending us these stories, we are able to summarize them, put them together, and give them back to the public to answer some of the questions that, that I get asked on a daily basis. And um, so give us, a, give us a background on this book, then. Give us a, give us a summary as far as what, what, what would people expect when they pick this book up. Sally, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, what they, would, what they would expect is first a little bit of science mixed in, but put it in, in pretty common, easy words so a good high school student could easily follow it. But basically, it's not a, a science book. It's a book uh, to give examples of how ESP occurs in everyday life. The, it, the, it shows the wide variety of experiences that people have, from the dreams that come true to the uh, um, uh, daily hunches where a mother suddenly knows something's wrong with her child and she runs down the street and finds the child has been hit by a car. She's 
completely out of sight and sound. There's no way for the mother to know this to happen. Uh, but we talk about mother's instincts, parents' instincts. Uh, we talk about the uh, pa- pairs of people, how one person seems to know when they're loved of the husband or, or is in trouble. And we just cover the, the whole range of what has been told to us. Now, I, I had a... Um I had a strange experience one time when my grandmother died years ago. I was very close to my grandmother, and um, she passed away. She had cancer. She passed away in the around five in the morning, and I was in my bedroom. I live with my folks. I was probably 21 years old, 20, 21 years old. I don't even know now. Um, I was laying in my bed, and I felt like this entire chill that started in my in my feet and just ran the entire my entire body to the top of my head and I sat straight up in the bed mm. and I was you know asleep until this point it was like five something in the morning and I just knew and then my mother had come in and told me you know your grandmother just died yeah. and I thought that was a very yeah. that's the only I haven't had many many experiences at all in the paranormal world and let me assure both of you that I don't want any <laughs> <laughs> many, many people are, are, are fearful or anxious if something like that happens but that's a quite typical experience uh, probably 10% of the people send us a report, uh, which is apparently not dream, not a dream, more than a dream. Yeah. Uh, most of the 60% of the people send us a, a, a dream, which wakes them up. Um, and the other 30% send us reports of something they know during the daytime when they seem, they think they're wide awake. But all of those are cases, very typical of what you just mentioned. And they un, un, typically do bring bad news. But on the other hand, uh, it's kind of a pre-warning so that when you get the actual news of something unhappy happening to you or your loved ones, you're a little bit prepared for it. So if, if there's a biological function, it probably is a warning system. Hmm. Now, I, I remember... It's the psychic oh. cell phone oh. that early man had before they had all this access to technology. Oh, yeah. I remember uh, back in the day also when we were down there at Ryan, I don't remember if you knew, remember this was not Scott, but... The uh, testing with the the dream transferal, you know, with the things on your eyes. Yeah, yeah. The ping pong balls. The ping pong yeah. balls. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they were. Half a ping pong ball. Cut <laughs> out the light so that you wouldn't. Mm. They're trying to simulate a room in which everything is cutting off as much of the stimulation from the outside world as possible, and then playing some relaxation tapes so that you'd begin in a relaxed, comfortable, but still uh, not uh, completely asleep. Mm. And then in the other room. Possibly, if you'd come in with a, a good friend or a relative, uh, they would be looking at a very vivid video clip of some emotional scene that was randomly picked from hundreds of other pictures. So there's no way you could just sort of guess what your friend would be thinking. You know? mm-hmm. And that's that was the setup for that is the setup for studying telepathy in the laboratory oh. nowadays. Okay, and the uh, the follow-up with that was that, if I remember correctly, Dr. Broughton said. That among the, uh, the the test subjects that were that underwent that particular test, that people directly related to one another, that is to say, mothers and daughters and mm-hmm. brothers and sisters, fared much much better than say close friends or husbands and wives. Uh, it's, it's, you've got that exactly right. Okay. We just duplicated that this last summer. Uh, mm-hmm. The same data appeared over again. Okay. It, emotionally emotionally close and. Uh, sometimes a score very high, but particularly biologically close people. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, now, Michael, how long did how long did uh, did you two spend together in, in putting this book together? Well, it took about um, I guess it was about a year in the in the writing, and maybe another uh, half year to a year in the uh, uh, production and publication. So it was it took a while, and the uh, the hardback. Uh, edition, the hard cover edition came out uh, last May, and then we found out uh, recently that they're going to do a paperback edition of the book coming out this May. That will be, um, we think, will we'll sell quite well because it's going to be very nicely priced. Uh, but St. Martin's Publishing in New York is going to come out with a paperback edition on May 2nd in bookstores and that. So. Great. So, so for all of those listening that want the cheaper book, yep. <laughs> wait until May. <laughs> wait until May. Yeah. You, get a, you can get a low price on Amazon. Not. Right now, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, what did did you now? Did, were you in Hawaii the whole time you were doing this research with her, or did you travel out to to the Ryan Research Center, or how did that work? Actually, uh, we did the whole thing. Uh, this is a modern world. We did the whole thing by uh, phone and email and fax. Wow. And um, I never even met Sally 
until uh, the week uh, that the book was published in New York. So Sally and I, we had seen pictures of each other on the e on the email and stuff like that, but uh, I had, uh, no, we did the whole thing uh, uh, long distance and by primarily by email wow. and phone. The way of the world nowadays, uh, seriously. It really is, yeah. It makes life very, I mean, we also do, uh, we found very interesting because we've done a number of radio programs like yours and that, and again, here I am in Honolulu and Sally's in North Carolina, and uh, We've been. Uh, I was up in Alaska one time on a on a trip, and we did a, sh uh, a call in from Alaska. And basically, today you can the the book world. Uh, everything is done electronically. Yeah, wow. That's that's it's a, the modern world. It, yeah, it, guess, it really is amazing. I, I guess in a way, this the show is also a product of that. You know. Sure. Um, sure. We, we were talking before we went on air. Trent and I were, and we couldn't remember the name of those cards. You know, the ESP cards with the wavy lines and the uh, what are those called? Well, it's called Zener cards from the name of the man who uh, made the design. But uh, ESP cards is just fine. And you know, we we still sell those uh, for people who want to test themselves at home. Are are they accurate? Them around. Although we, we don't use them much in serious work, although you could. If a high school student wrote in and wanted to do a, a project like uh, with the SP cards, there's no reason why they couldn't. <laughs> so you, you wouldn't consider them accurate today? Just as I, Statistics hasn't changed. The yeah. chances of getting cards, one out of five, let's say, cards, it's, it's, it just stays the same. Well, no, what, that makes sense. What's a what's a good score on a card? On a card, how many? First of all, how many cards are in the deck? There, there are 25 cards, of five of each kind. So the chance of getting them right just by chance alone would be five out of 25. Okay. Um, so a good score would be. Well, I I don't have the exact statistics, but uh, ten, if you got 10 right, that would be quite good. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I yeah. once saw a little girl get um, all but one right in a. Oh in my a, God. In a, deck, in a deck of 25. Yeah. In a deck of 25. And that was the most. That was the most remarkable experience I I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. Now, did she do this consistently? Beg your pardon. Did she do this consistently? You have no idea whether, right, Sally, whether she did, because they only did. You only uh, saw it once, right? I only saw it once, and oh. it was in a. Uh, she had been uh, this teacher, and she had a special bond, and I had been hearing it from the teacher, so oh. I went to investigate it. Okay. But uh, but well, once was all that she could do it for me on demand. Oh wow. Hmm. What what's what's the I guess what's the strangest thing you've seen, Sally, in the in the at being while working at the Ryan Research Center or, you know, with your father as a, as a child growing up, what's the strangest paranormal thing you've seen? Well, I, I think that one was that I saw myself. But uh -huh. every day I hear stories and they're sent to me. Now, again, I, I'm not trying to say that they're proof of anything. But uh, I'm sitting here at the, reading the stories that come in on the email to me, the accounts. And I'm, I'm still bowled over by uh, how many, for instance, some people, some people really have the gift, and I'm sure some of your listeners are sitting there home right now, nodding their heads, saying, "Oh my God, this is she's talking about me." <laughs> um, I would say about one out of every 20 person that writes me seems to have remarkable, almost every day, something that they know, some little thing that they know uh, what shirt their boss is going to wear that day. Uh, all the way to dramatic things like knowing when their grandmother died or when there's going to be a car wreck or having a 9-11 premonition. And mm. they have them very, very often. And these people are often very frightened by so, so much of this so that they don't talk to other people about it. But that, I guess, amazes me that, that there are some people that seem to be so gifted, while others like you and me have one or two cases in our life that are interesting, but they, they don't, they don't um, you know, shake us up like that. Right. And you know, one of the things that was interesting uh, when we were doing the book, uh, there was a Gallup poll that, comes out, I think it's every, every two or three years, on people's belief in the paranormal. And I was surprised when I first looked at it uh, and researched in the field that uh, one in four Americans uh, report having an ESP experience. So that's, and if you're, you know, if you've got 280 million Americans, you're talking, you know, 65, 70 million Americans have had an ESP experience according to them, their own belief. And uh, uh, belief in ESP in America is two to one. Uh, in favor of ESP over people who don't believe. The rest, uh, there's a, another chunk that doesn't know whether they believe or not. But uh, to me, I thought that was uh, quite amazing that that uh, we still, uh, in some circles, still uh, tend to doubt whether ESP exists. And yet, I think uh, the argument's over, not only from the Rhine Research Center's 
you know, 75, 80 years of research uh, and other research institutions, but also the fact that basically science may have a problem with it, but uh, uh, people tend not to have a problem with it. They, they may be embarrassed to talk about it, and they may they want to make sure that you're not going to mock them or kid them before they will tell you their experience. <laughs> But uh, if you've got one in four who've had experience and one in two believe it, uh, I think uh, at this point uh, it's really incumbent on science to, uh, to, to uh, or the, I shouldn't say science, on skeptics to, take a, you know, to, to lay back and move back a bit because I think this, this debate is over uh, as far as I'm concerned. That doesn't mean that everybody that claims to have any experience has one. But, but if one were to say, does ESP experience exist, does ESP exist, and I, I think that's a, that's a conclusion that's done. I, I don't see any reason to talk to people who want to uh, argue that point anymore. Well, we're going to take hmm. a short break. It's going to be about um, about a three-minute break, two minutes and 44 seconds, to be precise. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna, we'll be right back, guys, here on World of the Unexplained with Michael Schmicker and Dr. Sally Feather. We'll be right back after this. And we're back. Uh, once again, you guys still with us? Yes, we sure are. All right, great, excellent, um, good. <laughs> We've got another break coming up in the next uh, half an hour, and that'll be um, almost a four-minute break. That way, if you guys need to grab something to drink or something like that, just um, go to it. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, All right, so um, let's let's get into the book more. Um, what what exactly overall do you talk about as far as ESP cases as they apply to the, the average reader. Sally, you want to take that, or the average reader? Well, we just tell some. We just begin to tell some stories of the, give examples of what kind of experiences people have. People, when they write me, they want to know: Is this ESP? Is this not ESP? So we try to give examples to define what what we think it is. Now that ranges all the way from little things like staring at somebody and they turn around and look at you, or knowing that a friend you haven't thought of for years and you think of them one day for some reason and they happen to call you that day those are the little trivial things of everyday life that may you know but we we get uh, then we go into examples like the mother who had a dream in the middle of the night that her she woke up and she just knew that something terrible was going to happen to her infant who was in the other room she just knew it and she her husband said, oh, that's silly, be quiet, and, and she kept saying no. She'd had a, a vivid dream that the light that was over the bed had fallen down onto the bed and crushed her child, and, and she dreamed that there was a storm going on outside at the same time. Well, there wasn't any storm going on when she woke up, and her husband tried to calm her down. She didn't pay any attention. She went and got the baby and brought the baby back to her bed, went to sleep. They all went to sleep, and about an hour later, they were waking up, there was a huge storm raging, and the light that was over the child's bed had fallen on the crib and would have injured the child severely. Wow. So that's a typical kind of example. We give that. Maybe that doesn't happen to everybody, but that's a typical kind of experience. Yeah, and I think that uh, what Sally said, basically, the, Sally, correct me if I'm wrong, there's three types of uh, ESP, basically. One is precognition, where you know the future. That one I and that's the most it. common ESP reported. It's very realistic, usually very short time span. Things things happen, you know, within uh, minutes or or a couple of days from when you have this precognition, usually. And that's that when the chandelier fell on the uh, baby's crib, uh, you know, it happened about two hours after the the mother had had her precognition. That's a good example of precognition. Uh, telepathy is mind to mind. And uh, we've got a number of, obviously, out of 200 stories in the book, we've got uh, quite a few of those. But an example would be that there was a uh, woman in uh, New Jersey who had had a lot of trouble in her life, was getting uh, very despondent, and one night she uh, was uh, decided that this is it. I'm going to take my life. I'm going I'm to end this life. It's been a terrible uh, tragedy for me, and I don't want to live anymore. And as she uh, went to uh, pick up a gun and kill herself, she heard a, a voice in her head say, Marion, don't do it. Don't do that, Marion. And it, it so shocked her and so surprised her that she put the gun down because she recognized the voice. And the voice that was in her head was a, a woman she had known but who was actually living in Florida at the time while she was in New Jersey, while the woman who was thinking of committing suicide was in New Jersey. Huh. And uh, it stopped her from committing suicide. And the next day, 
uh, or a day after whatever it was, uh, she got a, uh, a phone call or a message from the woman down in Florida saying, you know, I had this terrible, terrible uh, thing. I, 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 I uh, had a sense that, that something was terribly wrong in your life and that you were thinking of doing uh, something to yourself that would that would be uh, uh, would harm yourself, and she said I got down on my knees and I prayed, and uh, tried to get a message to you that uh, whatever it was to have faith and don't and don't give up, and it was at that time when she had heard the message from the woman down in Florida, and I think that's a good example of uh, minds in tune. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I think the third uh, the third type there's precognition which we talked about telepathy and then clairvoyance. Clairvoyance is seeing something happening at a distance. If you're sitting in your studio and um, you uh, see a fire in, a, in your mind in a neighboring town and it burns up a building and you know the exact building and the place and that, and then uh, you know, an hour later maybe you see it on TV, uh, seeing something happening at a distance where you can't see it by normal vision, that's uh, clairvoyance. And uh, we have some great uh, great uh, examples of that in the book. There was a woman who in Michigan who had a uh, uh, they had a dog called Brady, and Brady uh, disappeared one day. And the woman was really trying to find the dog, and uh, so she put an ad in the newspaper. And somebody called her and said, uh, "We think we've got your dog. Uh, come out and take a look." And as they were going out there, she asked, she told her son, "Well, boy, I sure hope this is Brady because I I don't know. It's you know, it, it may not be, maybe Brady may not be Brady." And the little boy said, no, 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 don't worry, Mom, it is Brady, because I see him. Mm. And she said, what do you mean you see him? He says, I see him, he's in a house, and she goes to, he, the boy, tells his mom this whole series of things. The house, I forget exactly, something like the house is uh, painted blue inside, there's a man and a woman, there's a baby in a crib inside the house on the left-hand room. Uh, the woman has a green T-shirt on. I think she's a Green Bay Packer T-shirt. The man has a T-shirt on so-and-so. Uh, the house has, a, you know, a flat roof, so-and-so and so-and-so. And when they get there, all the things that he had described were true, and that was his dog, and that's where they found it. Uh, that was the uh, place where they picked up their dog. That's an example of clairvoyance. Now, do, course, do you think, the, do you think that other people could, could maybe take that clairvoyance, especially an example like that, you think maybe other people could look at that and say, well, this wasn't clairvoyance. Obviously, this child was having some kind of um, outer body, you know, um, meditative kind of experience. Hmm. Well, that could be the same thing, though. How that we, we could, and you could you say use the word remote viewing, but uh, if yeah, you have an out of the body, uh, some people say that they do have the out of the body and maybe uh-huh. go somewhere and see something. But we would call that all the same thing because it's not by any known sense that we can do that. Yeah, so, so you would just you would classify all that as clairvoyance. I would classify yeah. all that. Yeah, the words, modern <clears throat> word is called remote viewing, and you may have heard of the government's program. Right. I, the government uh, intelligence services had a Stargate program, they called it, hmm. in which they actually trained and worked with people to see if they could remote view what was going on um, in Russia or in... Places you know, thousands of miles yeah. away. Thousands of miles away. I believe the KGB had a similar program going on at the same time, but I could be mistaken. Now, the government anyway. actually listens to us. It's really kind of funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> They're listening right now. They Hello. probably are, yeah. The NSA. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, in all these cases, and all these um, experiences, is there uh, any kind of common thread as to the nature of their mental states? For example, are a lot of these things happening in sort of a waking sleep moment or, you know, at, um, you know, you mentioned dreams. Um, yeah. Is there is there a kind of like mental state where the the conscious mind sort of floats yes, away? Yes, there is, and I think that's a very yeah. good question because we nearly all the reports, let's say spontaneous cases, come from people when they're in some sort of either maybe you know during the daytime and they're driving along in a car, but but they're not actively engaged in like in some cognitive task. They're they're in some sort of somewhat of a passive state. You know, the, the the sleep researchers tell us that there's actually a sleep cycle going on during the daytime in yeah. which we're in a semi-sleep state, but we don't realize it. We call that work. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Et cetera. Uh, so we do think that the these ESP type of experiences are more likely when the brain or the mind or the spirit are, is in some sort of relaxed, meditative, or sleep state. Hmm. And that's, and that's in contrast to another phenomenon we haven't even mentioned. It, it's not mentioned in our book because we didn't have room for it. 
but that's the sort of the psychokinetic, the mind over matter oh. type, and that's also something we study. Would you like? It's uh, a different type of mental state, I think. Now, the the mind over matter. Uh, I don't know how this how this threads in, but y y going back to some of the the poltergeist cases yeah, that you hear about. that would be involved. Okay, that, that's that's what I was I was mm -hmm. thinking about. Are you guys going to get together and write another book? Well, I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty busy, but uh, who knows? Yeah. Never know. I'm co actually collecting stories from listeners um, that would relate to the more like the mind over matter, the 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 things which happen around a person, which could be the result of some sort of mental effect. No, where There's should the they send that to? from the wall, particularly when it's a time of emergency crisis. Yeah. Or the clock that just stops, or the com cause I say computer breaks down, and then I'd hear from everybody. Uh, but um, emotional thing, an emotional state when something happens. Okay. Well, where, where would they uh, send those particular okay, cases? Okay, they would send those to sally at rhine.org. That's okay. R-H. Sally with S-A-L-L-Y at rhine, R-H-I-N-E. Okay. Sally at rhine.org. All right. Excellent. That's great. I've, awesome. got, I've got a link for your webpage up on our website, too. You so, can check that out. Um, let's see. What, let's moving on, I guess, to telepathy. It was just a question that popped into my head. Hmm. Oh. Scott, were you sending <laughs> it to me? I was sending it uh, right anyway, up Anyway, yeah. but I, I, I'm kind of curious about this anyway. Um, in in the, the telepathic cases, um, would, would you say that there is a definite division between the cases for example um, you know obviously it has to involve multiple people that there are individuals who are more like transmitters and individuals who are more like receivers um, you know I mean and and does it go both ways or are people more who have these kind of experiences more like they receive the messages or or they they can send them out I mean uh, what, what would you say to that do you have any opinion on that Mike you know, I you know I don't think that uh, um, I I didn't remember us coming across any specific. Uh, uh, clearly, some people seem to be very sensitive. Uh huh. Right, That's Sally. Receiving I mean, receiving information. Some people do seem to be very sensitive in terms of receiving uh, information uh, that you know that is not brought to them by the five senses. Okay. That that somebody is is outstanding at sending the uh, the material i i know there's been uh stories in the past certainly when the original esp research was done in uh, late 18 uh, 1800s in in uh, england by the society of psychical research uh people got interested and they started trying to be the senders okay and they tried to send uh, uh an image or a thought or something to a friend and things like that and certainly uh, some people seem to be able to do it better than others, but but I don't think there's been any major research done on that other than uh, the question is is anybody at all yeah. uh, either a recipient or a, send, uh, a sender uh, do they have a talent? Yeah. There's very little evidence. We're not even 100 percent sure of uh, these divisions that we're talking about. We could be to in general we use the term psi p s i mm -hmm. to refer to all these phenomena that we're talking about. And in many of the people who uh, thinkers in our field feel that we're really talking about the same ability, the same thing, and it's just we made man-made labels about precognition and telepathy, and there may not be any one. It may all be the same thing. Everything could be remote viewing. You hmm. could even say that you're remote viewing somebody else's thoughts uh, in some way. Uh, that's conceivable. So uh, nobody knows. This is still in the realm of theory. Okay. okay. What? What what do a lot of um, a, a lot of other psychologists think about the work that you're doing at the Ron Research Center? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> it varies a lot. I just had a workshop this weekend, and we had a local psychologist who came who was just as interested and involved as any of the other people there. But as a group, they probably tend to be a little more skeptical than, let's say, engineers or physicists or other scientists. Maybe it's a little too close to home. You see, psychology itself is a new field. It only came about in the last, what, 100 years? Oh, yeah. And it sort of had to fend itself and separate itself from some pretty occult beginnings uh, in the history of science. So I think uh, they, sci psychology wants to be sure that they're considered a good science. 
before they can bring somebody we up. We think we're doing the same, using the same methodology to every bit as careful as any other science, in any other psychology science. Well, you know, I, I know that, that, you know, that a lot of the, you know, self-proclaimed ghost hunters and a lot of the scientists that are in there are scientists, and they use, you know, uh, different scientific methods to collect yeah. evidence. Very helpful when they are, too. Oh, yeah, EF, um, electromagnetic field meters, um, you know, uh, recordings, uh, all, all kinds of other stuff. Right, you need a really, real, really need a high degree of technical knowledge to do these field investigations. They're mm -hmm. much more difficult than the laboratory investigations. And the Ryan Center doesn't do any field investigations now. We don't have enough staff to go out and, and do that. So it is largely being left to uh, primarily to the amateur groups, although there are some people like Lloyd Auerbach off in California who, uh, who will be at our conference this summer. Oh, yeah. And uh, there are other, others who are, of course, they're quite good at what they do. Are you familiar with uh, Joshua P. Warren from yes, Lemberton? Yes, I know Joshua. Oh, yeah. Josh has been a friend of ours for, oh, quite some time. Hello. All right. <laughs> yes, over in Asheville. And he now has a radio program. Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not going to mention that here. No, no, no we're not. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's actually uh, going to be a guest on our show, too. He's going to be uh, a guest on your show. All oh, right. yeah. yeah. Little, and he's done later. some interesting thing, like trying to find the scientific expon expert explanation for some odd effects uh, like the brown mountain lights in north carolina yeah we oh, yeah. actually did a uh, show on that uh oh did you already do it okay well not involving joshua but i mean you we know, talked we, about some mysterious we talked about mysterious things in north carolina well right. i think any good scientist is looking to find out what's the explanation not to prove one particular theory that he may wish were true uh -huh. Let me let me stop here real quick. Anybody have any questions for our guest? The 800 number is not going to work for you tonight. You'll reach our producer, and he'll scream and yell at you and throw things. I'm kidding. But uh, you can uh, reach us here at uh, worldoftheunexplained at gmail.com, or you can jump in chat with us in the chat room, uh, worldoftheunexplained.com. Click on chat, make up a name, and come in. Or any go, kind to of the, name, uh, really. go to our network, omnisoundradio1.net, and you can jump in the chat room there as well. Yep. Um, all right. All right, go ahead. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, my mind drew a blank. No, okay, that's fine. I, I, I thought, yeah, I thought you question. had something. I did. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, um, what what would you what would you say to listeners as far as um, those that want to increase their ESP ability? Do you have any, or do you think it's possible if you if you don't have any, you can make it happen? Well, I, I, I'm suspicious of people who say they can teach courses in it. Yet. <laughs> mm, We're yeah. not sure that it's quite that that reliable but there are some things for one thing a person can keep a record of the cases the things that he suspects are are true are esp experiences keep notes of them keep a journal um second thing is to to, to relax and kind of focus uh practice some form of meditation uh, we just had a work workshop this weekend using the hemisync technique that the monroe institute in virginia teaches and i don't know yet for sure if that's any better than any other kind of meditation, but it, it could be, and if things of that sort, if one investigates states of consciousness, they'll find a, one state which may be better for them. Mm -hmm. and that's just one example. I could give some others, but I'll stop for now. Well, what oh, about okay. you, Michael? I'm sorry, go ahead. And, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, about, about the... Focus. Focusing on what, how one might improve one's ability. <laughs> well, I think that um, I mean historically, from uh, from centuries past, people clearly uh, the meditative state is the is the major state where you find people talking about um, you know altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a book by Charles Tart by the same name, Altered States of Consciousness, that that goes into some of these. Uh, these things, and I, I think basically the, the theory is pretty clear. You, when you've got so much uh, going on around you, noises and music and people talking, and your focus, you're trying to driving things like that. That's not gonna. That's not gonna help you reach uh, ESP or, or 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 get in touch with uh, with with those type of things. Uh, I do think that uh, that the meditative state is the gateway to uh, to uh, almost any kind of uh, ESP. Okay, have you, um, in your research, Sally, have you uh, encountered any of these, uh, I don't know if they're how exactly common they are in North Carolina, but um, on that subject, the, uh, you know, kind of like Tibetan mystics and the, uh, I don't know, Sufi mystics and people that follow r religious paths that, that, that practice um, these sort of acts and any kind of, you know, have you managed to do well, any I kind of... Well, I think it isn't every yeah, some cultures more than others, but every culture, early culture, has had shamans, priests, priestesses, 
uh, and I, we're doing a series now. We've been doing a series trying to get people um, give us some information about it, it's anthropological material. You can't go back and you know, get access to test yeah, of that course. sort, but you can certainly listen to them and, and pay attention to what they're saying. And there's so much commonality from one culture to the next that y you just know you're dealing with something really important. I would just call them the early um, anomalous or religious phenomena of any culture. And you see over and over again what we would call instances of the paranormal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it usually is meditation, and there's special people who have been selected or self-selected, uh, and they fit they fit the description of the modern of our modern people, except uh, they've added on some other belief systems, and it's, the belief systems vary. But I think that meditation, that practice, uh, yog uh, yogis um, are good examples. Heal almost, and then we get into the whole realm of healing, which we hadn't even mentioned, but we also include that in the paranormal. Well, I, I guess we can talk about that now, actually, um, mm -hmm. if you want to. Uh, and I, I was just thinking about the other sort of mind over matter things that you, you hear about in, in other parts of the world. And I don't know how reliable the, the evidence is. You know, the, the old walking on hot coals and, yeah. and placing uh, spikes and needles through the, the, um, right. the flesh and not bleeding. You know, just uh, bizarre instances about that. Uh, what do you uh, right, and it, it, I think the, the first stage of any science is to just collect a lot of the accounts. You can't control them, you can't do experiments, people like that. No. You can start collecting them, and by the time you put them all together, you, you do see certain similarities, certain kinds of people, and, and uh, I've got know, a for instance, maybe uh, the role of drumming and, and sound and different, um, well, I would, but does that facilitate? I would expect that, that there are some things there that we have to learn of what kind of sounds, Maybe what kind of the time of also um, the geophysical situation of the world? When mm -hmm. what is the um, what's happening in outer space that affects uh, can affect us here on Earth? You know, the biological found a slight correlation between that and and ESP laboratory results. Uh, what was that you said, Michael? I was going to say it could affect biological systems, but I don't know how your break is going. But uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Thailand for three years mm -hmm. and saw quite a few of those things you're talking about. Uh, my conclusion is that they're, they're real. Not all of them are real, but 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 the, those phenomena are real. I think uh, in the first book I did, I had a chapter on uh, uh, mental and faith healing, and uh, uh, study after study is mentioned and footnoted um, uh, the ability of uh, of yogis and uh, people who are in, uh, in different trances and states uh, to avoid pain, to uh, to put spikes through their their mouth or to you know, to put nails through their hands or to uh, do a lot of those things like that. I, I think they're they're clearly real. Some of them are clearly real. Okay, I've got okay. a question for Sally from a listener, um, and, and the question is, what do you think, or what does your guest think, is the source of the ESP? Is it sight, hearing, etc., only less understood, or is it fundamentally different from other senses? The guy's name's Paul. Hey, Paul. I know who you are. <laughs> oh, you know who Paul is? Yeah, I know oh. who Paul is. Okay. Hey, hi, Paul. <laughs> uh, so we make the assumption starting out with that what we're studying is natural and normal. That doesn't mean it's common, but we uh, we feel that as scientists and that is that it's something natural and normal. But but it's pretty awesome, <laughs> and it's uh, I can get quite spiritual when I think about all the implications of of it. But but yes, I do. We don't understand it all yet. But then. That's the beginning of any science, not to know the final answer. Uh -huh. hmm. Am I answering that right? I think I'm leaving out something. Mike can pick it up from there. So I think that's, uh, I mean, uh, I think, Sally, if I'm right, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically the approach is that, that uh, ESP is, not, is, is nothing supernatural. It's nothing, uh, actually it probably shouldn't even be called paranormal. It's uh -huh. actually just, uh, it's normal except we don't understand it. Yeah, okay. If that didn't answer your question, Paul, you can um, you can type some more and we'll uh, we'll do it again. Uh, okay. You can tell he's from North Carolina because he says sure. he says I reckon. So I know I, I know for a fact you're from North Carolina just like we are. All right, you got it. He says uh, okay. All right. Um, uh, go ahead, Trey. Uh, okay. <laughs> I thought I'd saw something else. So go ahead. Uh, I didn't. Okay. Um, what was the next thing I was going to talk about? I don't know if I can share what they just told me on the chat line. That's why I'm oh, okay. kind of waiting to see. You know, I, um, uh, if you want, uh, i give you an interesting case, Jay, that uh, came up after the book was published. 
uh, that your listeners might find interesting is about uh, uh, serial killers. Okay. Okay. And ESP. All Did right. You say that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What happened was that in the book we have a story about a woman in Connecticut who believes she avoided the serial killer named Michael Ross, um, who was in fact just executed about uh, six months ago, who who killed I think about 12 or 13 uh, young women in Connecticut in New England that area. And uh, she had a case where she felt that she had the person she had met uh, when she was a teenager was Michael Ross, and that uh, she avoided death uh, from Michael Ross because of her ESP. And the story is mentioned in the book. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what happened was we were on a uh, radio program, and a woman in um, uh, I think it was uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, emailed us shortly afterwards and said, "You know, I have a case where I believe that I." Um, was spared death by, from a serial killer, and his name was Ted Bundy, mm. another very famous mm-hmm. serial killer in the 70s that uh, killed quite a few women. Um, and what we did was we went ahead and normally we don't have the time and money to investigate each and every case that comes in. As, as Sally's uh, mom said, by the time, by 1948, she had so many cases and they had done so much research in the laboratory that they understood that ESP was real. And they were just collecting cases primarily to get a sense of what types of common themes do you find when you get 14,000 ESP cases. Yeah. Uh, and so, so, but on this uh, uh, example, because we had had this other earlier claim by a woman that she had avoided uh, death from a serial killer uh, because of her ESP, I went ahead and looked at both cases. Mm -hmm. And I did some research, uh, primarily interviewed both people at some length, and did some investigations on uh, the web and through public documents and things like that. And it was very fascinating because in the end, you cannot prove that they really did escape death using their ESP. But on the other hand, everything held together in terms of was it was it reasonable and rational to believe that the people that they met could have been serial killers and was it reasonable and rational to believe that they had information paranormally uh, received that allowed them to avoid uh, uh, being his victim but it was a very interesting exercise because it's very difficult to uh, uh, on these ESP cases to to do this type of in-depth uh, uh, investigation hmm. that, well, would, that would bring it scientifically. That's good. All right. Um, well, we're gonna we're gonna have to pause there again, Michael and Sally. We're gonna be right back. We're gonna take a short break. It is how long, Scott? This break's gonna be uh, right right at four minutes, three minutes, forty eight seconds to be exact. If y'all need some soda or water or, or whatever, okay. um, you know, feel free. And um, we'll be back with your questions for Michael Schmicker and for Sally, Sally Ryan Feather. All right, guys, we'll be back in a moment. Sacrificing millions of dead brain cells so you don't have to. This is Omnisound. And we're back on, guys. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, you can email us. Oh, that was smooth. <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, you can email us uh, here at worldlyunexplained at gmail.com. Yeah, a couple or you of can, elephants running around in here. <laughs> or you can, um, you can just hit us up at the uh, chat room tonight. Yep. Yeah. Um, we, we are, well, I'm not even going to explain it. If you hadn't been here, just hit us up. The, the phone's not working, so just hit us up on the chat room, or you can um, hit us up um, on the email if you have a question. Uh, and uh, going back to what we were talking about a little bit about before the break about the serial killer and the lady who uh, you know, avoided imminent danger, the ladies, I should say, um, it prompted me to another question that in these psychic experiences, um generally it seems overall that that they are sort of geared towards negative things like i'm i'm aware that there's someone's going to be in a car crash or there's going to be imminent danger to somebody that i know or to myself personally and i wonder if that's just i mean is that very common it, it it's all geared towards the negative like you don't have a uh, a positive are are positive experiences rare and they are they're more rare. Okay. The ones examples we've already given the, uh, the the little boy who found his dog was a was a good one, although he was he was aware of his dog being lost, which was a 
bad, a, a sad experience. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd say about 80% of these real experiences that get mailed to us are about something, something negative. Uh, it's as if this ability, if it were valuable at one time early in civilization, was probably a warning. Mm -hmm. And I know soldiers have come back from various wars have told us that they felt, you know, they avoided danger. Most of us don't have a, an ordinary life, aren't, aren't facing with danger all the time. Right. The instances of cra car crashes and so forth are, are not as common as happy things. Mm -hmm. But it's very rare to hear of somebody who knew what the lottery was or uh, found uh, some valuable thing that they... Uh, they're, they're nearly ne always negative. You're right about that. And do you, uh, do you imagine that maybe because, uh, potentially because these negative things uh, bring a lot of... Uh, you know, like heightened emotional states. Like I know winning the lottery will heighten your emotional state exactly, but <laughs> yeah. not quite in the same way as as uh, yeah. someone you love who's in who's in danger. And maybe that's mm -hmm. the trigger or one of the triggers, possibly. Like, yeah, I, I think it's part of the whole animal human system. You know, cats and dogs and so forth are and, and people are alert if there's something wrong. Otherwise, we're kind of sitting back and you know, not we're not all agitated and aroused. Right. Well, I remember, Sally, you had, I think in the book we mentioned uh, actually seven out of ten uh, experiences in a survey of some of the uh, cases in, uh, in the Ryan Research Center's collection dealt with death, injury, or accident. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as far as the uh, emotional tie, it's clear because they found that uh, about 40 percent of the ESP messages that uh, people got were uh, information about their immediate circle, their family and their close friends, and it started, it, it tails off after that. Another 33% is information about yourself, perhaps you're saving your own life in that, uh, but only 13% uh, of the uh, ESP messages that we get are about strangers. Hmm. So very clearly that, that uh, the, the information, that the, most of the information you get is about people you, you, Don't you have an emotional bond with. All right, and when we have, and we do, and when they are about strangers, it's often something momentous like um, the 9-11 event. Uh, we got more reports of uh, premonition, people that had premonitions or experiences at the time of the incidents happening uh, than we ever have before, and I hope ever will again, uh, people who, who just seemed, had some feeling of something bad that day or, or changed their whole day around. As a, we have a whole chapter in the book devoted to those experiences of, of just that one event because it was so horrible. And it was so emotional, whether you knew somebody in it or not, you were affected, right. you see. Now, here's a question for both of you. Um, how do you know that, that these stories are true? Well, and we, we tried to address that several times. It, it's hard to put qualifications in, in every sentence, but we don't know that any one story is true. Um, you know, your best friend tells you a story, and you know him and you trust him but i don't know him <laughs> yeah, yeah. so we just have to, we just have to say that if they appear to be sane normal people we hope that the similarities and the patterns will be accurate uh even if the memories aren't um over over a period of time but it's hard to think that 14,000 people would just you know be be lying or be that forgetful hmm. i think also Sally we made the point in the book that uh even though these these cases are, are, are just evidence, they're not proof, that uh, in fact over the years uh, about half of them, there were over 30,000 cases that uh, came into the Ryan Research Center and only about 14,000 of them made it through the screening and the screening wasn't, it wasn't uh, like uh, investigative reporting, but it, what happened was obviously you look for people who, uh, I mean, you can, uh, I think you yourselves can probably tell if somebody's well, slightly nuts. Oh, yeah. You yeah, know, we, versus uh, somebody we, who's. We throw away some that just don't, oh, I respond to them, but I don't include them for the, in the. Uh, if, if you talk to somebody, in general, you can get a sense. I mean, is the person, uh, does he, is he sound sane and uh, do they have a reason to lie? Is there, a, is there a motive to that they might, are they looking for publicity? Mm -hmm. Something like that. But, but uh, basically, uh, you're, uh, the, the proof comes from the laboratory tests. And the book has a whole chapter on the laboratory tests and the results of those laboratory tests. Mm -hmm. That's the science that proves ESP. But the cases do, I, I'm with Sally, I just don't believe that 14,000 people uh, have gone out of their way to lie or to, or even had that, that bad of memory because some of these things are so dramatic 
that well, you, you, ten years later there there are a number about of your grandmother now you know you remember that because it was so striking and so unusual now now maybe it was coincidence yeah. you, you know yourself you have to you stop and think well gee could I just is it just coincidence uh, sure but, you know because people remember these things uh, many of the reports we get are from things that happened when they were child children and they've remembered them all their life because it was so different and so unique they didn't have dreams of somebody dying every night you know and, and so they re tend to remember them uh, but again you, it, you have to sort it out and say that we, we think we have some truth here but it doesn't matter if, we, if we're not accurate if our cases are not all accurate no so, sorry about cracking that can open. It, it, it would reverberate. Oh, well. It's Diet Coke. It is Diet Coke. I promise. <laughs> it's Diet Coke. Um, um, well, the next question I have then is, do you think, either one of you think that it's possibly that we don't, you know, that science says we only use something like, what, 10% of our brains? Do you think that maybe this other, these people that really do possess, like the little girl you were talking about earlier, Dr. Feather, some kind of way to tap into that other part of the brain that, that the general populace can't? That may, may be an explanation. Also, also, yeah, and then in the same sense, I would say that people who are um, these amazing wizards uh, uh, who know mathematical uh, mathematical geniuses, or or the poets, or the musicians, uh, are, are definitely using more of their brain than the rest of us are. So I, I think of these a, a little bit like talents or gifts. The name of the book is the gift. Mm -hmm. uh, that these are talents. Uh, special abilities. Yeah, let, let me let me let me mention your books again. Uh, it's it's called ESP, it's the gift, and it's uh, available on Amazon.com. It's also available on BooksByMichael.com, and um, you can email either either of the authors. It, it either um, you can email Michael. You can can you contact through through your site, Michael? They can, they can too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, you you can also contact um, Sally through the Ryan Research Center. That's Ryan.org, R H I N E. And um, you can um, talk to them if you have an experience that, that you think is um, is worthy of, um, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, going back to the using the that other sort of fuzzy part of the brain that only so many people uh, can use, have, have you conducted experiments? I mean, is it possible for you to conduct, like, I mean, sort of the nuts and bolts of it, the uh, chemical processes and, you know, uh, um, electrical you know, connections in the brain itself. Brain waves mean. and looking at the correlations. Uh, yeah. A lot of work has been done. I am not not up, I'm not up on the latest uh, research of all of it, but uh, some a number of work has been done. I tell you, I'll tell you one of the most interesting kinds of research that has uh, come along. This has to do with like the precognition side of things. Um, you know, you all uh, sometimes. I think one of you mentioned there. You, your body knows something. And you don't, your mind doesn't know it, but you, you jerk, or you, uh, and, and then you stop and think about what, what, what made me upset. Well, they have, uh, scientists have, in our field have studied, um, the, the name for, this, for the study is called the pre-sentiment, or pre-response. And this is a reference to the fact that uh, in a laboratory, when, if you give somebody a shock or show them an a, a emotional picture, the body will respond, and this can be measured in many ways by the galvanic skin response or blood, blood change in the blood volume, many uh -huh. ways of measuring this. But when a person is hooked up so that the body measurements are taken, we have found that before the picture is shown, now, when the picture is shown, uh, it, it normally jumps up, the uh, blood volume does. Huh. But right before that, be depending upon the kind of picture, if the picture is a violent one, there's a slight reaction where it begins, the body begins to prepare itself before the picture is shown, an uh, emotional picture, as compared to a calm picture. So mm. it's as if we can now have a measure of a subtle, subtle effect of the body that's got to be precognitive. We can't think of any sensory explanation yeah. for how the body alerts itself. So that's a, and you can also look at brain waves and, and notice the brain changing before these pictures begin to are up here, shown, okay. actually shown. No, no. What, 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 what got you involved in this, Michael? In into the ESP research. Well, uh, I was in uh, Thailand in Peace Corps. I think I mentioned, uh -huh. and yeah. uh, Thailand has a animistic beliefs. They believe mm -hmm. in spirits and uh, in trees and in uh, rocks and things like that, uh, as well as a, Bo a Buddhist uh, beliefs. And uh, I 
sort of got it. Uh, I was fascinated by that, started reading up uh, quite a bit more about that, and I've been a journalist all my life, and when I got back to the United States, I sort of let it go for a long time. I was a business, uh, I still am a business writer, and uh, but about, oh, about six years ago, I had read a book, I come across a book about uh, out-of-body experiences by Robert Monroe, who has actually, I guess, a, a center there in North Carolina. Uh-huh. And I, uh, it was sounded so convincing uh, that because I had some people, some scientists who had studied him, his brain also, uh, and I thought, wow, this is sort of interesting. I've never heard of this, and yet this sounds like it's fairly good scientific evidence. So it started me on a three-year um, investigation of uh, about nine different paranormal phenomena, and that resulted in the book called Best Evidence, oh, okay. which primarily has uh, uh, talks about the best scientific evidence for mm-hmm. these nine phenomena. Huh. What part of Thailand were you? Uh, uh, I was in uh, I was in Bangkok doing educational television programs. Oh, okay. Yeah, my background was uh, journalism and uh, television, both. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, I get a couple of questions, but I I, I don't want to totally. No, go ahead. In a completely different direction. Oh, go ahead. We, we can always come back. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you mentioned earlier, Dr. Feather, um, the instance of the of the government basically um, operating these sort of programs of, of remote viewing. Have they um, have they approached you in any way uh, to? Um, oh, it's to like see. she can tell us that. Come on. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, the government's listening now. Have they approached your father? That's a question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> no, I, in reality, I can tell you that we, that we, the Ryan Center, was not involved in these studies, but some other very prominent um, parapsychologists, Dr. Russell Targ and Dr. Hal Putoff, and a place at Stanford Research Institute, and now the name has been changed. Uh, oh, okay. They were involved in this training along with the various government agencies. Our book goes into this in quite some detail i think we have um is it one or one one long chapter talks about some of the research that was done uh with that even though it's um because it what because it does relate in to what we're talking about in the government studies yeah. and one of the main people in that work was joe mcmonagall he has been one of their star remote viewers and he's a now member of our advisory board and a very good friend and he, he actually has a business in which he helps helps businesses um <clears throat> locate Hello? 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 I'm still on. Okay. Dr. Dr. Feather? Feather? I think we may have lost Dr. Feather. Oh, my goodness. You know, I can finish up her thought there while you're trying to catch her. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, Joe McMonagall was one of the stars of that uh, psychic spying program by the uh, uh, U.S. government in the 70s and 80s into 1995, I guess it was, when it was declassified. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did a number of uh, outstanding uh, remote viewings for them, tracking down... uh, um, uh, CIA, uh, CIA agents that had been kidnapped by terrorists and tracking down other uh, various people and, uh, and a lot of things that are still classified. Right. And so that uh, he's actually now on the board of the Rhine Research Center. Oh, very cool. Okay. And, and uh, I guess a an, an sort of follow-up to that, what about the, uh, what do you think about the instances of uh, these uh, so-called psychic detectives that go out and help uh, police departments with uh, crimes and, and whatnot? Well, some of them are, some of them are clearly real, and some of them are clearly uh, uh, outstanding in what they do. And the person that studied that most was uh, an, a man named Dr. Marcello Truzzi, and he up in Michigan, and he uh, professor up there, and he actually started a site called the Blue Sense, which were uh, he collected just like the Ryan Research Center collected general ESP. He collected um, stories and cases of psychics working with police departments around the United States to solve crimes. And I think his conclusion was uh, very clear that there are some people that are indeed psychic and then can and can do much better than would be expected by guessing or any other way to help uh, police departments find uh, and solve uh, mysteries and that. So the, the, the phenomenon is real. I'm not saying that all the people that claim to be uh, psychic are, mm-hmm. but the phenomenon itself is quite real and it's been uh, well documented. Oh, and it could be a... Uh Brought to good use, I guess, in in many instances. Yeah, certainly. Okay, wait a minute. I think we've got. I think we've got uh, Sally here. Hang on. Sally, are you with us? Hello, Sally. Hello. Hey, Jeff. 
Oh, you got her. Oh uh, no, I, I've, I've got I've got oh. our producer on the phone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's the, it's the, it's the NSA, Jay. It, it probably <laughs> is. It, 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 is she on the, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Sally, are you there with us? I don't. I don't have her. Okay. Um. Hmm. <laughs> It's it's always the yeah it's always fun. I know when we were talking with Jim Mars a few weeks ago, we had uh, a lot of phone problems, not on our end but on his. Yeah. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. yeah. He's well known, yeah. Oh yeah. Better help. Jeff, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Is she is she not online? Uh, she was just a second ago. <laughs> All right. Well, you wanna you wanna try us again then? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> well, that's rather interesting. Maybe I shouldn't have talked about this whole government thing after all. Hmm. Or, well. or w- <laughs> well, this is the so there's people in Reston, Virginia that keep coming uh, to our they, website. They, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I just kind of digressed a little bit there about the uh, uh, program. Scott, do you have something? Um, no, not right now. I'm just trying to get this difficulty straightened out. Yeah, that's understandable. Um, Anybody's got any questions, they can email us worldtheunexplained at gmail dot com, or they can uh, come into our chat room. Hang on, we think we got her again. Sally? Yes. Okay, oh. great. Sorry about that. Oh, I guess the government cut me off, didn't yeah. they? Yeah, they didn't want you talking about that. Yeah, basically. <laughs> they beeped in and said, hey. Okay, secrets. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Don't tell. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's we, we to think, our listeners. We think that Michael finished your thought, though. Yeah. I think he did it. Yeah. <laughs> kind of finished up that whole uh, angle of the discussion. <coughs> Are you all right? Yeah, yeah okay. I'm fine. <laughs> All right, good. Everything's working again now. All right. Um, so, what what do you think? Uh, what, what was the most fun about getting this, putting this book together? What was the most, um, I don't know, the most uh, most difficult chapter you think that you worked with on this book? Difficult one. Difficult. Difficult in a fun way. No. Well, Michael did. I sent Michael the stories. Okay. And um, basically, he had to organize them in the best way that. He, he thought um, they should go, and, and maybe it was working with you know the editor said we like thought one idea, and the editor thought maybe another idea. Yeah, I think the the, the basic uh, if anybody's ever tried to write a book, uh, have you all tried to write a book at all? I was an English major in college. I wrote a novel one time <laughs> in high school, but I I lost it. It was probably not a very good novel. I wrote so. for the paper. Oh, really? Yeah. I wrote for the paper. I was the editor of my college newspaper. Yeah. Oh, pretty good. And on the radio too. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, well, no, I've never tried to write a book. We, uh, when we were doing the book, uh, we originally had uh, an idea for the book that was going to focus primarily on mother-child ESP, okay. mm-hmm. because uh, we thought that would make an interesting subject for mothers. Everybody wants to know whether their kid is a super, uh, super psychic kid, and mothers always feel often true that they have a special bond with their children, and we actually, it ended up as a chapter in the book, but we sold the, the book idea uh, our agent in New York sold the book idea uh, to St. Martin's on that basis, and then we got the contract, signed the contract, and then the editor uh, let us know that, in fact, no, she wanted a different book. And uh, so we we ended up using that as only one chapter out of 10 or 11, and she wanted this uh, more a collection uh, doing ESP and war, ESP and uh, romantic relationships, ESP and uh, mother-child, um, things like that, ESP and war, things like that. So um, the biggest difficulty was switching around. We had, uh, I had, I think when we were done, we had like 50,000 words done on that first uh, uh, style of book and had to scrap everything but about 10,000 words and oh. start from scratch. No, and we ended oh, up with 80,000 words. So that was, that was a pain, the, that was a royal pain. <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. <laughs> but it's a uh, St. Martin's is a major publisher, so for us it was, uh, uh, and they gave us good advance, so it was, uh, it was <laughs> always a good that, that yeah. was She was such a great editor. I don't think anybody found any uh, errors in the book. It's a, it was a well edited book. Uh, one of my favorite chapters we haven't even mentioned yet, but it's the one which is, is fate inevitable. Okay. Because people yeah, that's always want to know, yeah. you know, if something oh. bad, you know, bad dream. Can you change it? Can you change fate? And that's an, it shows an, I think it shows an example of how case study can become really scientific and really teach, teach you something that you can't learn in the laboratory. Mm-hmm. And that was, we looked at, uh, we had well over 400 cases where there was a negative outcome where you would want to change it if you could. 
Well, of those, there are only about a, a third in which actually a person had a chance to change something because they didn't know enough. Or there's one, my, my, my favorite tragic story, if I had to pick the one that makes me the saddest, was of the grandmother who uh, had a vision of seeing a child that was killed lying on, a, on the ground. She couldn't tell if it was a girl or a boy or, or what age it was because it was all covered up, the child was. And she, but in the morning she was so scared because of her dream that she called and told her neighbors and her grandchildren and everybody, the one child that she didn't, uh, of her grandchild she didn't think about, was worried, wasn't was worried about because this child lived in a fenced-in yard and was never allowed out. Oh, no. But that particular day the child got out and a truck it, it killed the child. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that, that's terrible. That is uh, the worst example of his fate. And, uh, you know, it looks like it was inevitable in that case. Huh. But in other cases, the few cases that we have where a person knows enough to ha- actually have a vision of, uh, of the experience, and we have several in the book, uh, it, looks, it looks like that fate was, was able to be changed by the person knowing they had this dream and therefore avoiding getting in that car or going on that particular bus route or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the, if I remember right, Sally, there was, what the answer was, yes, you can avoid fate mm-hmm. uh, if you try. If you and try. Two, and, if two, and two out of three who did try did avoid fate. Uh, that's but the right. Problem, the, of the small number that were able to try, <clears throat> yeah, two out of three did. didn't take their dream seriously because this had never happened before. We yeah, the problem was that people just didn't that. try. Second time they, you have a dream like that, you pay a little more attention. <laughs> if you get that chance. Yeah, if you do you get that chance. That, and the reasons they didn't try were really amazing. I mean, uh, some obviously a lot of them just to dismissed a, it as a bad nightmare, right? Because most times if you have a, a nightmare, it doesn't come true, right? No, I, I don't know. I've had a nightmare. I've failed the bar exam, and we're, we're still wondering. <laughs> 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 but but I, mean, I think, you know, people just dismiss One was the, the reason they didn't try was because they, they just dismissed it as a nightmare. Others just forgot. You know, the next day they wake up and they didn't quite remember it, but then when it happens, they, as it's happening, they remember it. And a lot of times also they had inadequate information. Uh, Sally mentioned one. I'll give you another one that was very interesting. A woman had a dream that her son um, was bitten by a dog, uh, bitten in the face by a dog. And it's such a vivid and powerful dream that she decided she was going to protect her son. So she kept her son in the house for uh, three days. Wow. You know, and of course you don't know. Normally, precognition doesn't tell you when it will happen. You know, the date and the time. Rarely do you know that. Usually, just see a generic uh, something is happening, but you don't. It usually doesn't have a calendar on the wall or a, a clock in your in your vision. And uh, she kept him inside, and then after three days, he went down. I guess he he walked outside. And he went over to the to the store right next door to the house to get some uh, candy or a soda, something like that. And he stepped on the tail of a dog, and the dog turned around and bit him in the face. Hmm. And the point that the mother was saying is, you know, I, I knew something was happening, but I didn't know when or where. Yeah. yeah. All I knew was something was going to happen, and I, I could visualize exactly what happened. Was what, what she saw was what happened in real life. The problem was she just didn't know when or where it would happen. There wasn't enough information. Yeah. So um, in general, in these cases, uh, when they, there's sort of two questions here but the first the precognition when you when you um see something that's going to happen i mean is there sort of a time frame in which it happens is it pretty much all near future as to say you know, within the there, there, actually there was somebody once that plotted uh, the uh, time of, of these cases uh, in, in the history of animals of psychic or research uh-huh. and they do tend to fall off with time most most things occur very close to the time of the experience uh-huh. But um, but there's no way of knowing, and that's it's inexact science at this point in time, for that reason, um, and people's own experiences. Now I do have some some people. The one a woman in the book that we call Marie, that's not her real name. She has frequent enough experiences that she's kind of learned about herself, which ones to take seriously and which ones are probably just just ordinary dreams. Uh, not many people have a chance to build up that no- self-knowledge. There may be clues that there are there, and that's one of the reasons, again, you, you can't study all of this in a laboratory. And that's why I'm always interested to hear from the readers and the people on your show who want to write in 
what they have learned. Uh, is there some clue that they have learned about themselves, or, or maybe not, whatever case it is, uh, that we're still collecting the, the basic data, I would say. Oh, okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to take a short break again. Well, actually, this is a rather long, longer break. This is, uh, we'll give you about five and a half minutes. And uh, we'll be back, guys, uh, World of the Unexplained, with um, Michael Schmicker and uh, his co-author, Dr. Sally Ryan Feather. We'll be back in a bit. Stay tuned. From talk to rock and everything in between, the best variety is right here on the OmniSound Radio 1 Network. Back. Hey. That was a nice little break there. Yeah. All right. Um, great. Um, so, where, where did we leave off here? We we're um, talking about um, the whole fate issue and yeah, whether you, know, you can prevent these things from happening. Every, and, every time I listen to you two songs, I really like that one in particular. I sort of wax philosophical. Um, <laughs> and I was talking to Scott about this question, and it's kind of heavy. And I'm not really sure how to word it, but basically, guys, when when these precognitive things happen, you know, you see what's some kind of negative or positive thing that happens in, the, in your future, it, it kind of uh, implies that that future is pretty much set in stone and that the choices that are made are not, I mean, your own personal choice in that particular instance can, you know, maybe uh, prevent something unfortunate happening to you, but in general, I mean, if it works for this one instance, for this one group of people, that perhaps it works for, you know, every every everybody else under normal circumstances. Do you go into that at all in that particular chapter in your book, guys? Um, the, the best thing I, I did on that one um, was, actually I went back and looked to see what my dad thought about it uh, before I thought too much about it myself to see what the history was. He used to think that there was the results of the, the, the tests of precognition have not been that striking. It's just a, a weak effect. It's not like people get all of them right. Uh, the little girl, when I saw the little girl do it, it was not a precognition test. Uh, so he felt like there was uh, there was a lot of wiggle room, you might say, left for uh, <coughs> possibility of, of um, not the future not being determined. And, of course, that was the whole point of our chapter was can you avoid fate if you know enough about the future? So yeah. um, I, it doesn't worry me. I don't think it does imply a strong um, determined uh, future, maybe something, but... This whole question of time is, is, is very complicated. But yeah. so, Michael, what do you think? Yeah, my my gut feeling is that it is not uh, that fate is not uh, locked in at all. I think that certainly there are a couple of cases where, as as with that young, uh, as the the girl that Sally mentioned, the little girl that died, sometimes there are certain cases that say, "Wow, this is really." Uh, she did everything possible to avoid the thing, and yet they still died. I think there's cases out there, but again, uh, clearly if you look at the data from the studies that the Ryan Research Center has done, if you try, if you see a future, uh, uh, a future event, and it, and it comes to pass, and you try to avoid that, that future, two out of three times you will. So mm -hmm. if anything, I think you'd have to say that, that in the majority of cases, fate is not uh, foretold. The future okay. may be foretold, but not fate. Right. It was Does that just, make sense? Yeah. 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 Well, let me let me let me ask you a question, Sally, about your father. Yeah. Um, I've read a lot of a lot of stuff that has his name in it. You know, obviously he's one of the um, the granddaddies of the paranormal world. I guess you could call him uh, one of the inventors to to a certain extent of of what people do now in this kind of area. Um, I I I believe I I remember this correctly, but correct me if I'm wrong. Was was your father J. B. Ryan? Was he in the business of trying to debunk a lot of these psychics and a lot of these um, these other people that claim to have certain powers in the beginning? Well, he never he never consciously I mean he never uh, publicly uh, did debunk anyone. Uh, well, he did. It re I know what you're thinking about. Way back in the very beginning, before yeah. he got he, before he got into the field, he was trying to find out was there anything to this. He did go to a famous. Uh, to, look, to best investigate a famous um, medium of the day, and this is now in the 1920s. Her name was Marjorie, and she was very popular at the time. And the first time he went to the seance, he, had, he was just a young man who'd come from a science background, and he observed what was obvious fraud in, in um, the way things were being done in that one interview or the one seance, I guess, they went to. 
and I think that got he got some publicity for that. So that ever there, from there ever after, he was sort of thought of as a debunker. But he never consciously. It was his belief was if some something's real, we'll pay attention to it. If it's not real, we'll just avoid it. And it doesn't get you anywhere to go around telling, you know, <laughs> debunking people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did, did he do some work with Harry Houdini at one time? I don't think they ever made contact Houdini. Okay. Hmm. I don't think they did. I'd have to check the archives, but I've never heard of any uh, co- actual correspondence. Houdini was a great skeptic. Oh yeah. Of course. Actually, oddly enough. Uh, you know, Sally, that what's interesting on that, that, the lady I think that your dad uh, was looking at was Marjorie Crandon, was it? Yes, that's correct. And Marjorie Crandon, I just finished uh, doing a review of a book oh, yeah. called called Spooked. Uh-huh. Spook, I guess it is. Oh, no, I've read that, actually. Actually, I'm lying. I didn't read it. I was, <laughs> I was coming back God. from Jacksonville, Florida, and I bought it on audio CD, and I, I, I listened to it. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, well, I'll give you a funny story about uh, Spook. I just did a, a fairly long review of that for the Journal of Scientific Exploration. Oh, great. And, and while that book is, is a lot of fun, and uh, it's, got, it's one of the wittiest books I've read in a long time, uh, her... A take on um, on Marjorie Crandon uh, and the things she said were actually uh, she's very poorly informed. Okay. And and what happened was that in fact Houdini uh, at that thing decided that she was a fraud and announced that uh, Marjorie Crandon was a fraud. And there's no doubt that at certain points uh, you could point to some possibilities of fraud, as I think as Dr. Ryan uh, saw. L- let me but let me interrupt you a second, Michael. Huh? Right, let me interrupt you just a second. Sure. I think we've we've made history on this show. I think it it looks like that we've maxed at ten thousand listeners right now. Oh, the, oh that's good. But on the internet, just on the internet alone, not yeah. including the other um, radio stations. Yeah, the other stations. Well, that pick I hope up. they're enjoying it. You guys are doing a great job. Thank, well, thank you. you. Y'all are doing you, a great oh, job. Yeah. Go ahead. Go, go back into what yeah, you're yeah, saying. Back, Sorry to interrupt. What happened was on that uh, on that book, uh, uh, Houdini actually. Was, is known as saying that Marjorie Crandon was a fraud, and that's what uh, the book Spook uh, by Mary Roach says. Uh-huh. But in fact, if you look at the original accounts of all that, uh, all those events, which were published in another book called Is There an Afterlife by David Fontana, who's a very famous researcher in England, uh, in fact, Houdini uh, was on record in writing as saying that he could not uh, possibly duplicate some of the the uh, phenomena that happened in that uh, in some of those seances, and that he felt that in some of those seances the phenomena were real. So I I, I couldn't help no. just throwing that in there. Which 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 one is well, this, Michael? It, it could well be there's this mixture of uh, people who yep. do very well and yet they do something fraudulent. They're cheap when they get a is, chance, yeah. Is mm. found throughout much of psychical research. Doesn't necessarily negate everything. I think what they've often found is that a person uh, has mixed that they they it happens to them spontaneously or through some uh, skill, and that skill either leaves them or or it doesn't come on a day and they decide to fake it because they've got a tremendous amount of of uh, money, you know, involved. It, it, money involved or fame or fame. or uh, you know their own reputation, and so what happens is even though they do. Uh, produce some real phenomena, like real spontaneous ESP, or some real spontaneous psychokinesis, that it's very hard to produce on demand. Well, let me ask you now. Now, which which one? Which case were you talking about? Is this where she's in the library looking for the ectoplasm, and the, she gets this book? Oh, uh, that the, was actually that was Helen Duncan's case, right? Okay. The the one with the uh, the ectoplasm. That was that was a great story. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. that was one of the funniest books. You're, you're right. You know, it's called uh, Spook by Mary uh, Roach. Yeah, it is. And it's one of decent. the funniest books you'll ever read. But again, uh, think of it as the dessert rather than the broccoli. It's not it's not good food, but it's uh, it's certainly tasty. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Fruit Loops. No, anyway. no, we're still free. I mean, as as far as uh, any of the listeners that live in North Carolina or come passing through, they're still free to to drop in on the Ryan Research Center, aren't yes, they? Or? Uh, it's good if they want to uh, contact us first, so they know what day we have an open program. Every Wednesday from twelve to one, we have a public open, free uh, public uh, educational program or research findings. Okay. And then we have a, a number of excellent evening programs with a little fee, and we have this wonderful conference coming up in May. All of that is on, mentioned on the website that I mentioned earlier. And that's yeah. Rhine.org. That's R-H-I-N-E dot O-R-G. Yeah, www.rhine.org, yeah. And uh, also uh, Michael's site is booksbymichael.com. Yep. Right. 
So, um, yeah, that's, that's great. All right, guys, we've got about um, 13 minutes. So um, let's let's kind of boil down any, anything that you guys want to get out there to the listeners, yeah. anything that about the book or, or anything else. I want to emphasize again, which is the reason I wrote this book. I wrote this book in response to the many letters that I get of people who are worried and upset about it. And, of course, if they're listening to your program, they're probably already on the way of accepting that paranormal is normal or they wouldn't be listening to you. But uh, any of those people that are worried about their own personal experiences, uh, once in a great while there is a cause for worry. You know, some could be something chemically wrong that makes people have think that they're having ESP when they aren't. But basically, nine times out of ten, it's a natural and normal phenomena, and that's why we. What I, my reason for being involved in this book was mainly to help with that educational purpose. Oh, okay. What about yours, Michael? You know, I think uh, I'd like to echo one more thing that uh, Sally said. One of the reasons she wrote the book was to let people know that uh, ESP is a natural phenomenon, not a. It's, it's, it doesn't. If you have ESP, it doesn't mean you're blessed by God or, or cursed by the devil. It just happens to mean you're, you're human. Yeah. And I think one of the things that was interesting in the, the book, the the other thing that that I think is very strongly worth uh, mentioning to people is that. There has never, if I'm right, Sally, there's never been a case where somebody has been 100% right in their ESP. It just doesn't happen. And if, if you meet somebody who says, boy, I can tell you the future, or I can, you know, I've always been right on something, uh, it just doesn't happen that way. Uh, ESP is, is a very quirky thing and is not something that, that even the best uh, people with the, the gift uh, are able to be 100% right. And we had a very funny story that uh, there was a woman in the in the book who had a 9-11 experience, and she's clearly a gifted person and has had some great uh, ESP experiences that you would think that she's one of the best or among the best. But she tells a story on herself. She said that she, uh, for a while, thought she was, boy, she's really getting everything correct in that. And then one day she had a, had a premonition that her mother's friend down in Florida died and she called her mother and, and she said, uh, Mom, you should call your friend down in Florida because I've had an ESP ex, uh, commu- a message uh, and your friend has died. And the mother didn't really want to call down there. And, you know, and, <laughs> are you dead? <laughs> yeah, are you dead yeah. or something like that. And fortunately she didn't because what happened was it turned out that the woman was quite alive and that nothing at all had happened. <laughs> and her point was that even her, who had a lot of accurate ESP experiences over time, was not 100% correct. I think that's very important to let people know. Uh, believe me, even if you have the gift, you can be wrong. And you have to use good judgment. That's always, no matter how psychic you are, you still, you know, we, we have a, a brain that was given to us and we've developed it and we have to use that uh, to make judgments about when to take action and when not to take action. Oh, yeah. Mm, definitely. I don't mean any puns here. Uh-oh. But um, what what do you guys hope to see the future of your research um, lead to? Lead to what? Where would you like general, to see it? General happen? acceptance of, of of this as a yeah. legitimate um, scientific phenomenon, or, yeah, or okay. that's one. All right. A- anything else? More understanding, and also a, a, a broader a broader study of the whole the whole issue of consciousness, not just the paranormal, so called, but that would include. Uh, the wider range of things. Uh, we just science needs to move now into looking at, at man himself and uh, in the generic sense, and what what is this a part of consciousness? What does it mean? And how is it? How do we fit in the world? Are we interconnected with each other? And what does that implications does that have for the world? Hmm. Now, do you do you do a lot of work uh, with with uh, other aspects of, of paranormal at the Ryan Research Center as far as like you know the the orb photos and. Um, you know things like that. Well, we collect those, but we don't actively study. Uh, we because we're so limited in what how much we can study. But we there are other the parapsychologists who study other phenomena, and we try to keep up and keep in touch and share experiences with other labs. If somebody sends me a sto- story suggesting reincarnation or out of the body or near death experience, I might send that to a colleague. For instance. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, I, I was just curious because one of the things you know I've seen these photos before. The orbs. And, yeah, the orbs. And, and, you know, I've seen them on videotape, too, where I'd be in a room with, with Josh. You know, I went on a couple of paranormal mm-hmm. outings with him. But I would see the things come, you know, flip by on a video camera that we couldn't see while we were in the room. Yeah. And the next thing you know, I mean, you know, you know, you can't see them with your naked eye, but you can pick it up with a camera lens. 
and you know, and they'll zip around erratically, and they're like, oh, these are these are ghosts. A lot of people say, I'm like, you know, no, these these aren't ghosts necessarily, or souls, or whatever you want to call them. These are just something that that we don't know. It's, it's an energy field. And I just don't think that we have a, a proper explanation for it. I mean, if I were... kinds of energy fields that we don't understand. We also have yeah. to watch out for d- dust on the camera. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah well, trust me, this one Real simple, outside. common <laughs> things, you know, and sometimes throw the whole thing off. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's interesting to, to see the, the way that a lot of people miss uh, mistake well I, I think mistake you know certain things for other you know it's like you're if you're a caveman and you know i walk up to you if i'm a time traveler and i, <laughs> I, I fire a lighter in my hand you'll think i'm a god scott you just ripped you know? that off from land of the lost did i really yeah oh, you did okay. that i don't watch t te- i don't watch much tv at a all lot of it was on okay i'm sorry i watch one show that's boston legal it's once a week and i usually miss it because i'm reading something but uh but it, but it, your point's right though scott you know that that um well, the world of the unexplained. It's a fascinating world. Yeah. <laughs> it certainly, it certainly is. It just, it just seems like a lot of people, and I think I think there's a misconception with ESP too, and you know, not only ESP but just the paranormal in general. You know, I, I think a lot of people say, oh, oh yeah, you're one of you're one of those guys, or you know, yeah. and they don't really consider that what you're doing is 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 really scientific. In exactly, nature. and that's what that we feel the strongest about is that we do have a scientific base to whatever we study, uh, basically bottom line yeah and um that also uh lends itself a certain amount of credibility a, a great deal of credibility oh yeah I think, compared to just oh, we're, know, we're not going to have some nutball on the show that has no you know well we we've, we we have had some, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but uh we get all types but yeah. uh, it's usually uh, there, there's usually something behind it we're not just going to blatantly pick somebody if somebody called me and said they were elvis presley i'm not going to interview them on the radio now, yeah, if they've talked be. to Elvis Presley, like this one lady I'm trying to contact, and says she wrote a book through him, that person I want to talk uh, to. Scott, but, uh, you haven't talked to me about that. Yeah, well, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things out there that can't be explained, and, and I think science is the way to to solve them. Maybe not in all cases, but yeah. in, in, in majority of and them. And to sort of maybe hopefully codify things which are still very much uh, anomalous and... Uh, uh, Confusing and maybe a little bit um, bothersome to a lot of people, you know, and, and then to sort of get a broader, greater understanding of, of, of these things around us all. So, so uh, we can visit you guys at the uh, well, not you guys, both Michael and his, and I'd like to visit you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Surfing out here, you know. <laughs> I'd definitely like to visit Michael. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, we can we can visit you at the Ryan Research Center, maybe. Uh, and you said Wednesdays, you guys were. And Wednesdays. Okay. Absolutely. That's a, that's Eight to a, five or? I'm at, uh, tw- 12 to 1. I'm talking about collective and shared dreams this coming uh, Wednesday. Okay. okay. We, we might stop up there then and check that out. That would be great. We've cool. got about five minutes left. Michael, you got anything? Yeah, you know, uh, let me just throw in something. Two things. One is uh, a lot of people love uh, James Randi, the, uh, the, the professional skeptic. Oh yeah. I, oh, yeah. I just wanted to I wanted to throw a, a website uh, and invite people to take a look at a website called www.skepticalinvestigations.com. And what's interesting about that, about that is it's an investigation of the skeptics. And you'd be amazed at at some of the uh, the things they found out about skeptics. It's that I would say pretty clearly that there are quite a few of them including Randy are intellectually dishonest. Hmm. Huh. And are not scientific at all, yeah. and I think if and all I'd say is if you want to take a look, go take a look at that website. Uh, it's run by parapsychologists of top uh, uh, top quality scientists, and just read it and just make up your own mind. And, but take a look at the evidence they've got there. The other thing I think is that uh, I think that science, uh, which focuses primarily on the uh, the things you can measure physically, uh, that science is at a is at an end right now. It's done very well up until now. It's described the world extremely accurately in terms of what it, it has as its goal, which is the physical world. Mm-hmm. But I think that the future for science is going to be in consciousness uh, studies, uh, not in uh, the, the continuing uh, to look and to believe only that the world is the material. I think that after quantum physics, I think that's, uh, that science is, uh, is dead. Huh. Well, I agree. That's a nice, nice way of summarizing I should say dead. I, I just think that it's, it's, well, it's, it's still reached there, its, its limit. The other is more important at this point. It's reached its limits. Yeah. Well, um... Well, guys, we'd like to thank guess, you for being on our show. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure and, a, and great fun. I hope uh, it's been the same on your ends as well. 
certainly has. Well, thanks so much, you guys. Oh, absolutely. And uh, when you guys write another book, make sure, you know. Let us know. Let us know, and uh, <laughs> we'll talk some more. Yep. It's been fascinating. And, uh, is it Jay? You're going to just finish law school, yeah? Just finished, yeah. I yeah, just took good the luck bar. on your uh, bar exam, huh? I, I took it, and I'm waiting for the results. Not not available until March 29th. Well, apparently. you just have to ask Sally to psychically look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've actually asked. There's a lady that does full moon radio after us, and she does a psychic thing on Wednesday nights. And I said, Oh, really? What did right. she say? We have to find out whether it's true or not. <laughs> she, she said she thought I did poorly on one section, but she couldn't see anything else. But her co host said that, that I, I passed. So. You know, I'm I'm holding them to that, guys. Well, <laughs> so, Scott's yeah, shaking his finger at the screen. That she's right, so on your money back. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you got a 50-50 chance you're right. So. Uh, that's exactly, true. exactly. Well, guys, we appreciate you being on the show. Thanks Thank you so, so much. much. Okay, Thanks. take care now. Okay, okay you too. Good evening. All right, bye bye. Bye. All right, that was um, wow. That was that was pretty good. I like that. What do you think about I that? I thought it was fascinating. You thought it was fascinating. Yeah. I hope our listeners found it was fascinating. There we go, a little Elvis. A little and less conversation, a little I feel more. Like a little bit of, a <laughs> little bit of rock and roll tonight. That's it. Well, you know, we did really well. We, we got over twelve thousand listeners tonight. That's crazy. Oh, you guys are, you guys you are, guys are great. awesome. We love you. We yeah. love you. Email us if you got any ideas about any guests yep. you know, in the future. Because um, speaking of guests in the future, let's talk about them. <laughs> guests in the future. Right. Currently, we have twelve thousand two hundred nine listeners. I'm hyped. I feel like Howard Stern. No, I'm kidding. I don't. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, you know the great thing is, that, speaking of the future or the past or whatever you want to call it, mm, we've the got future of the past. We got John Teeter's uh, website ranting collector uh, coming on um, next next Monday night. Oh Oliver yeah. Oliver Williams, the time traveler himself. Well, no, not well, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. He talks about and, the and he time says traveler. he doesn't know if it's if it's real or not either. So. It'll be kind of cool. I mean, um, I'm looking forward to that one. Looking forward to all of our. All of our future guests. And we and, just got uh, a new guest, too. Uh, yep. Yesterday, I think. Uh, let me see. Who are they? Uh, the newest guest that we got was a guy named Adam Go Rightly. And um, he wrote uh, a couple books. One's called The Prankster and the Conspiracy, and the other is The uh, Be- Beast, marked out the best of Adam Go Rightly. It's oh, a bunch yeah. of. Uh, he basically calls himself a uh, self proclaimed uh, crackpot historian. Wow, crackpot historian. Yeah, and he's a 33rd degree Mason. So this should no be kidding. Uh, no, no kidding. Masons. I can ask him some questions. I've always wanted to ask a Mason about, you know. Oh yeah, what's the, what's the secret handshake? No. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> Just some uh, maybe myths. Masons are very much the unexplained. Yeah, they are. Um, but um, anyway, fantastic. It's been a great show. Thank you so much, listeners out there, and uh, you guys on the radio. Yeah, and stick um, around because Full Moon Radio, they're going to do, a, I think, a, a repeat of that show after this. Yeah. That's, yeah. So, um, anyway, All right, I guys. guess that's uh, that's it for now. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Trent Lackey. We, uh, we're hailing out of Kernersville, North Carolina, a small town where we talk about big, big things. things. That's right. <laughs> yeah, All okay. right, guys. Well, thanks a lot. We're All right. out of here. We'll see you next time. <laughs>